All right, so welcome everyone again to an LFCC information session. This is Accommodations 101. It is being led by Vivi Mater. We're also going to have an appearance by some students who are currently at LFCC in the Bond Club and in the TRIO program. So without further ado, here is Vivi and her presentation. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for putting this together and thanks everybody for coming. Um, like Kelly said, you know, a lot of people tend to have questions. Um, I'm hopefully going to go over all the basic stuff, but likely you will still have questions and that is fine. So um, at the very end, my email will be up. Kelly's also put it in the description. Feel free to email me anytime. Um, I, you know, try to get back to people as quickly as possible. So hopefully you'll get an answer within 24 business hours. Okay. So um, also, obviously I work at Lord Fairfax Community College as per the large thing on the screen right now. Um, but just know that a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about today are pretty universal for anywhere that you're going to go. College accommodations, our college accommodations, our college accommodations. <laughs> Doesn't really matter if you're talking about a two-year institution or a four-year institution, a private school, a public school. Once you get to college, a lot of this stuff is just going to be what it is pretty much everywhere. So you can take this information with you even when it's time for you to transfer because that's what a lot of our students do. They come to us for a little while and then they move on to a four-year institution and it'll be the same situation once you get there, okay? So, oh, that's not what I want to press. You know what, Kelly? Listen, we're already, already, I'm already having technical issues. I'm, I'm not even on slide three yet. Okay. So the biggest thing is people always want to ask me, what are the differences between high school and college? What do I need to get ready for? How can I prepare to come to college? What are, what are just some things so that I don't feel so overwhelmed once I finally get there? And that is great. And there are tons of things that you can do. Some of them are not even necessarily a part of the direct accommodation process, but they're like peripheral things, okay? So they're things, these are skills that if you build these up, they're also going to help you in your college classes in conjunction with your accommodations. So just some general things I always tell people to start focusing on and working on uh, organizational skills, time management skills. And these are not things by the way, that have one key answer. There are things that work differently for all kinds of students. So just sort of start playing around with that and this whole concept of being organized. <laughs> now, um, I just actually emailed my students that I'm advising not that long ago. There's a ton of apps out there that you can get for your smartphones that have like visual planners and visual organizers and things that have all these alarms and bells and whistles. So start trying some of this stuff now before you get to college so that you have an idea what works for you before you get here. Um, another thing is self-advocacy is huge. And it's not just huge in college. You are going to be advocating for yourself from now until the end of time. So it's a good, good practice to get in the practice as soon as possible. And a lot of my students always tell me that the more that they do it, the more that they practice, the easier that it gets. It's always hard to first go around. Um, and once again, there is no one way to advocate for yourself. So some of my students practice by talking to their parents their case managers, their guardians, their mentors, their friends, whoever they have that is a cheerleader for them. They spend a little bit of time talking about what is their diagnosis? What are their accommodations? How do they learn best in the classroom? These are important things for you to know about yourself, okay? So practice being able to verbalize that. However, some people can't by definition of their diagnosis. Those students a lot of times like to pre-write a letter that they can turn into professors with their accommodations or that they can share with me or whomever at the college that they want to share that with. So there's lots of ways that you can do that, but it is just imperative. I cannot stress it enough that students really learn how to like take that torch from their parents or whoever has been the student's advocate up until the point that they get to college and start practicing doing it without someone standing right there helping them along the way. And many students do practice that when they are in high school, which is great. A lot of case managers in particular do a really good job of talking to students about that before they get to us at LFCC. Um, so I think that that's wonderful. Just keep doing that, okay? Keep practicing. <laughs> 
Um, you know, there's a lot of other stuff about college too. It's just kind of a different environment. It's a little more independent. Um, so start thinking about, you know, what are some ways that you can, that you can help yourself as a student, you know, like study groups, you know, joining clubs and organizations, that kind of stuff. Once again, it's peripheral to your academic classes, but it's helpful for you in terms of your long-term success as a student. So be thinking about the big picture, you know, all those things that are going to be helpful to you. But guess what? Disability services in college is different too. And that is because the law is not the same anymore. So let's talk about that. First, I'm gonna take a drink out of this giant mason jar. This is not moonshine. I always have this around and I think people think that I'm just drinking whatever. It's water, but I just whatever. Okay, so the law, it changes. Listen, when you are in the K-12 environment, you're covered by the Individuals with Disability Education Act, IDEA. Okay, and that act more or less is all about early intervention it's about special education, it's about IEPs, it is about making sure that you have an educational team that is built around you um, because in the K-12 system, every single student is guaranteed to get an education. Everybody's getting some kind of piece of paper at the end of that 12 year or 13 year, I'm not great at math, obviously. <laughs> at the end of that time frame, you are graduating with your free basic education that everybody is guaranteed. And in college, you are not guaranteed a degree. You are guaranteed access to a degree. That is where the law changes. So you're no longer protected by IDEA. You are protected by Title II, Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the ADA, American with Disabilities Act. Those two things are gonna carry you through your college education. So keep some things in mind here. I think I skipped something. Yes, I did. Okay, the key point to remember is that generally the purpose of the IDEA is to ensure that students are successful in the K-12 system, whereas the ADA and Section 504 only ensure access because success in college is up to the student. Now, let me make a note here, okay? Because we always, always, always talk to students about, you gotta be college ready, you gotta be college ready. You know, there's a lot of pressure on the students to get ready for college, but um, that's a very old school way of thinking. And a lot of universities and colleges are starting to shift that, that mentality to being student ready. And LFCC happens to be one of those places. So before where it was like, the bar is here and you have to find a way to meet us. Now it's like, we're trying to meet you halfway. We wanna make sure that we are also student ready. So even though this is what the ADA in section 504 says, and this is kind of the philosophy that historically colleges have functioned under, you're gonna see some changes happening. You're gonna see some changes at LFCC too. We wanna make sure that we have a lot of resources in place for students so that when you get here, you have all the things <laughs> that you could potentially need in order to actually be successful as a college student. That is huge for us, okay? so. Some differences in colleges, just to reiterate, you are now an adult. Now I know that there are some parents on this call who are thinking, I don't know about that. My kid still does not do their laundry by themselves. I hear you, I understand, <laughs> but technically, <laughs> technically <laughs> your precious baby is now an adult. So we, you know, we kind of expect them to function a little independently at this point in time. Um, we do not know who had an IEP in high school. And this happens every single semester. Let me run you through a scenario, okay? I'm sitting in my office and halfway through the semester, I get a phone call of a hysterical student that is like, I just took my midterm exam. I didn't get my double time on my test. I asked my teacher and he said, you didn't give them my IEP. And I'm like, that's because I don't know who you are. And I didn't even know that you had an IEP, okay? It happens at least one time every single semester. And it's really unfortunate. Like, it's, it really breaks my heart a little bit because that tells me that somewhere in the line of communication, we missed something someplace, okay? So I'm glad we do presentations like this so that we can get the message out there. We don't have that information. When your high school transfers your info to us, it's just your grades and your GPA. There's no like label on your folder that says this student had accommodations. We have no idea. You have to self-disclose that information to us, okay? 
or we will never ever know. Same thing if you're transferring in from a four-year institution or another two-year school, because um, that has happened before as well, where someone comes from another college, and so they just assume that the disability services offices communicate with each other. We're not allowed to do that. Your information is confidential and it's private. So unless you share it with us, we won't get it. So just please keep that in mind. Um, your self-advocacy skills, they're going to develop over time. You know, so you'll come to us and hopefully you've been practicing those things. They're going to get better the more and more time that you spend doing them, like we said previously. So just keep that in mind as well. Like, don't get discouraged if you try to advocate for yourself one time and you're like, well, that was terrible and I'm never doing it again. Don't say that. We want to have a growth mindset. So just get back in there, you know, try it again. And hopefully it'll get better the more that you practice it. Um, parents and advocates, we get a lot of questions about can they come to meetings? Can they be a part of the process? They can be the part of the process when students invite them. So I don't have meetings with just parents. Um, that can't happen when we get to college. The student always has to be included in that. Um, and the conversation has to mostly be between me and the student. But parents are more than, um, you know, it's fine if they want to pipe in and share some thoughts and stuff like that. And I obviously, um, can talk until my face turns blue. So I will probably talk to you anyway, if you're in my office, I don't just ignore you. Um, but we do need to make sure that the student is the one that's in the driver's seat for this, okay? Another big thing is confidentiality. So if you have seen your IEP, if you have an IEP and you've seen it, it is long, it is like 150 pages or 20 or something, something like that. Um, but it has a lot of info in it. It's, it's, um, kind of an invasive document for an adult, to be honest with you, because it has your diagnosis, has all your testing scores, has your goals, has statements sometimes from your teachers about what you do well and what you don't do well. I mean, it really just puts all your information out there. What I write for you, what colleges write for you is generally one page, maybe two pages, doesn't have your diagnosis on it. We don't disclose that information. We don't tell people why you qualify for accommodations. That's their business only if you tell them what your diagnosis is because you want them to know, not me. So um, there's just a lot more privacy when you get to college and some students really appreciate that, you know, cause not everybody likes to have their business up on blast. Um, so just to reiterate those two big categories, communication with parents does change. Um, and keep in mind, a part of that IEP process, the parents have to be involved. You all have to sit around the table you know, once or twice a year, whatever it is, and your teachers come to and you all talk about it and everybody signs everything. And that's just not how we do it in college. By law, we cannot just, you know, talk to your parents about grades and whatnot. We have a special form that you have to sign in order for us to really, really be able to talk to parents. Um, but even then, we still like for students to be involved in the conversation. And even in the case of legal guardians, I do get this question sometimes too. Um, so legal guardianship is a little bit different, as we know, but even in that case, we prefer um, for the student to be present for those conversations as well. And then accommodation arrangements, big difference. K-12, it's the school's responsibility. You have, um, you have a case manager who gets your parent to sign your IEP, and then they pass it out. They distribute it to all of your teachers or whomever else might need it. And in college, I write a letter and I give it just to one person, and that is the student. <laughs> That's it. That's the only person I give your letter to. And it's your responsibility to make copies of it. And it's your responsibility to pass it out to your professors. Keep a copy for yourself. Keep a copy for the testing center. Keep a copy for any tutors that you may have that you feel like might need that information. You're in the driver's seat for that, too, because maybe you want to give it to your math teacher because math is like not your best area, but you love English. And so you're not going to give it to your English teacher. Guess what? You can do that if you want in college. That's not my personal recommendation. Usually my personal recommendation is pass it out. Like you're spreading peanut butter on bread, like just give it to everybody, but it's up to you. That's up. You do you, you know, you're in college now. So the process, here we go. Uh, I also get a lot of questions about when we do things. So um, I don't, I cannot write an accommodation letter for someone that isn't actually technically a student at the college. So you have to become a student first. So you got to apply to LFCC, you got to go to new student orientation, then you got to go to a new student registration appointment, get your schedule all set up, officially become a student, 
get your email up and working once you've registered for your classes. And then after that, we do your disability intake. Okay, so student stuff first, extra stuff second. And there's other extra stuff too that you might wanna explore besides just disability services, okay? Disabilities are all over the place. I mean, um, something that a lot of people don't realize in college is that you can also get an accommodation for temporary medical conditions. I have a lot of students who unfortunately um, get concussions in the middle of a semester because maybe they were in a car accident or something like that. So they would qualify for an accommodation for that condition, for the duration in which they are experiencing symptoms, and then maybe later on, not so much. And so they don't need the accommodations after um, the symptoms have subsided or what have you. But a lot of other things are chronic conditions. So we have a lot of students who have learning differences or specified learning disabilities. We have a lot of students who have traumatic brain injuries. We have students who have medical conditions, both chronic and temporary. We have students who have mental health conditions. Um, you know, we have all kinds of stuff. Um, and you do not have to have had an IEP or a 504 plan in high school in order to qualify for accommodations in college. So that's another thing that happens sometimes. Students will come to me and they'll be like, I didn't realize because I didn't have an IEP in high school. I just thought if I was gonna qualify, someone would have already told me I qualify. Um, but that's not the case. So if you had an IEP in high school, then we do recommend that you get accommodations in college because that makes the most sense. Um, but you don't have to have started in high school or middle school or whatever the case is in order to qualify for college accommodations. So what you do have to do for us is you first have to apply and I'll show you the link for where you go to do that. So you have to self-identify and fill out our web application. That sends me an immediate email ping. This person just filled out your accommodations application. I usually email you right back and I'm like, cool, the next step is you need to turn in your documentation to me. So here's our documentation guidelines. And once again, this is pretty standard. Most colleges and universities have the exact same situation. So most recent documentation, there's like a, a rule, it's like based off of some like not great science in my opinion, that it needs to be within three years, um, you know, or not, <laughs> it just depends. Some conditions are chronic. So if you were diagnosed, you know, five years ago with something, um, your diagnosis is not gonna change because you have that condition for forever. And that's, you know, you don't need to necessarily have that updated, but other times it is. So like I, I had a student one time who was diagnosed with um, a speech and language impairment in kindergarten and then hadn't been retested since that time. So that's a little old. Um, that's not the most accurate information or the most accurate picture of what's going on with a student. That would be a case where we would say you should really consider updating your documentation. So it just kind of depends on what it is and how old it is. Um, but whatever it is that you have, just go ahead and send it to us. Let us see it first. And then we'll tell you whether or not this is going to work or this is not going to work and why. Um, so it says should be no older than three years. That might not be true. Whatever. Um, we do also prefer that it's done utilizing adult norms for testing. Um, like, I don't know, once again, how, how the science works out, because like your brain's not done cooking until you're somewhere in your 20s. So like, I don't know who made up that rule, um, but it's it, it's in there. Um, once again, just like the three year rule, that just depends. <laughs> so that might be the case for you. It might not. Just send me what you have and I will take a look and let you know if we need you to retest or not. Um, so before COVID, you could like bring this stuff to my office physically and drop it off for me right now. We're just doing everything via email. I anticipate that in the future, we'll continue to just do this electronically, uh, cause it's just a lot easier to have one system. So we're all doing the same thing. There's also always a note about IEPs and 504 plans, um, that those are not necessarily sufficient. So most of the time your IEP plan is good enough and you can just turn that in directly to me. Sometimes it is not. Well, let me give you an example of when it is not. Sometimes you end up with an IEP for something called an other, other health impairment, OHI. In that case, you may have a medical condition that somebody not at the school diagnosed you with, but the school saw that documentation and used that as a way to get you an IEP. 
So in that case, I can't use your IP because now we're talking about like a telephone party, third party information. I need to see the thing from the doctor, not the IEP. That's more common for 504 plans than it is for IEPs. A lot of 504 plans are written by your school, but it's because maybe a counselor in the community diagnosed you with generalized anxiety disorder, for example. So I would wanna see the thing from the person that diagnosed you. Um, Cause in that case, the school did not. They're just basing it off of something else that they saw. And I wanna see the same thing that you sent them, okay? Uh, all right, so after you turn that documentation into me and we read through it, we do a little intake process where I speak with the student and we talk about, you know, what accommodations you may have had previously, if you ever had accommodations, sometimes you didn't, um, you know, how does your diagnosis impact you in the classroom? What accommodations did you really feel were helpful versus ones that you really didn't use at all? Cause sometimes in high school, they're like, yeah, I stopped using such and such in my freshman year, my sophomore year, I haven't used it for the last two years. Um, just because it's in your IEP does not mean it has to go into your college letter. We fine tune it for what you need now. Uh, so uh, it just depends on what you want. And you ask me, you can ask me for any accommodation and I determine whether or not it's reasonable. So like, you might be like, uh, I need a note taker in class. And I might be like, yeah, that is reasonable. I will get you a note taker for your class. Or you might be like, I would like to bring my parrot in its cage to class um, that squawks once every two minutes very loudly and abrasively. And I would be like, that is actually not reasonable. So I'm going to go ahead and deny that. But let's talk about some other options. It just kind of depends. So it's just about, you know, what is your diagnosis? What makes sense for that? How do these things fit together? Why is this reasonable? There's a lot that kind of goes into it. Um, but here's an example. This is like a lot of words I'm throwing up at you on the screen. We have a lot of students who have extended time on tests or who record lectures or who want priority seating. Um, they want note taking options. They want to test in the testing center. They want an alternative format for textbooks, so on and so forth. So like I said, just ask me, you know, whatever. I, I've, there, there's no way that you're going to ask me the most silly thing on the planet. I'm sure I've already heard it. So just ask me what accommodation you want, and we can talk about whether or not that's a good idea or not. And if it's not, I'll tell you why. So you'll have an idea of what, why I said no. Um, but generally, we try to say yes. We try to make it work for you, okay? So sometimes what that means is you had an accommodation in high school and you want the exact same thing, and I have to say no to that, but I'll give you an alternative for what is reasonable in college. And let me give you a quick example of that. So in the K-12 system, we, they have usually resource teachers or case managers who can read tests aloud to students. And at LFCC, we do not have a person that reads tests aloud to students, generally speaking. There's no staff member that does that. But we do have technology that is available that does that. So we have a program called ReadWrite, and it's on all of the things everywhere. We actually have a free download that all students have access to, even those that don't have accommodations. And you're more than welcome to use that. So can't have the exact same thing that you had in high school, but we can give you the college alternative to that and show you how that works and get you familiar with it, okay? So just ask for the accommodation and we'll see what we can, we can figure out. Also, just because you have accommodations does not mean that accommodations is the only thing that's gonna help you to be successful. So you need to take advantage of any other supports that we have on campus. Um, like, for example, we have free tutoring. Well, it's not exactly free because like you pay for it in your tuition. So actually you're paying for it. So you should just go ahead and take advantage of it. <laughs> so we have tutoring. Uh, we have a testing center, which is a quiet testing location. We also have another program I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, called TRIO. We have a program called Great Expectations, which is for students who were previously in the Virginia foster care system. We have veteran services. We have services for students that are international or speak English as another language or DACA students. Um, and on our campus at Middletown, we do have a sensory room. Um, I believe they're trying to work something similar to this out at the Fauquier campus. Um, and we also have a club called Bond Club, which stands for the Bureau of Neurodiversity. Um, and a little later, we'll talk to a student who participates with Bond Club and you can you know, get some idea for what happens in there, but more or less, it's a social club for students who consider themselves to be neurologically diverse. 
Um, it's led by myself and a really great retired faculty member named Raymond C. Love, who um, is diagnosed with autism and works with a service dog. And so he's a great mentor for our students. And it's just a time when we can all come together and say things like, something really weird happened to me in class the other day. Here's what it was. What do you guys think I should have done in that situation? And like, we can, we can talk about it. You know, it's a safe space to be able to do that. So TRIO is another thing I always recommend that if you have accommodations or you're considering accommodations, you also look into TRIO. Um, this is a federally funded program. It's not just an LFCC program. Once again, happens at lots of other colleges and universities. So check it out anywhere that you go. I'm not just trying to rope you into LFCC's uh, TRIO thing, but you can go to lfcc.com. No, lfcc.edu. <laughs> backslash trio. And this is a program that's for students who either have a documented disability, their first generation, meaning that um, neither one of their parents have a college degree, or um, they are considered a low income student. So it's just an extra safety net, has free printing, quiet lounge space, we work in conjunction with each other, disability services and trio, it's like one big happy family. Um, so just a lot of extra things that come with being in that program, just like those other programs too, like great expectations, for example, there's a lot of extra things that come with being in those types of support programs. So that is my general presentation for you. Um, now we're going to hear from some students and then we're going to move on to questions. Like Kelly said, when we move on to questions, we'll stop recording so you can feel safe to ask me. But if you don't love, um, talking aloud because public speaking is not everybody's everybody's favorite thing, which is fine, then feel free to email me too. And this is my email address, vmater at lfcc.edu. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so how about we start with the student who's currently in Bond Club, just to get us started. Okay, yeah, so I will introduce our Bond Club member who is Heather. Um, Heather's delight and Heather, share with you whatever you feel like you want to share about bond club hi guys <laughs> uh i've been in bond club i started um my first semester at lfcc i joined bond i was really glad i did i was scared at first but it's it's a it is a social club but like it just feels like really relaxing and it's just a chill environment like you're not expected to um like do or talk talk about certain things if you don't want to um and it's just really ex accepting of everyone considering it's the brio of neurodiversity <laughs> and so like me i'm autistic and like i don't have to worry about if I may not say the right thing or something because everyone understands and could help each other out with stuff. Um, let's see question. Oh, um, Bond Club meets once a week. We've been meeting on Thursdays. Um, as of right now, since it's all virtual, uh, we meet through Zoom. Um, I think yeah, it's from three to four mm -hmm. in the afternoons. Um, and like it, the last, the last semester when it was in person, it was on Thursdays as well. Just the time was a little different. Um, yeah, so we talk about a wide variety of topics at Bond, <laughs> like topics including neurodiversity and stuff, but also just most random topics that we're interested in. Literally anything, some that are just very intriguing that you wouldn't usually be talking about in any other situation. <laughs> oh, and uh, although we do not have an official mascot of the club, um, we've decided, or I decided, that our mascot would be Coriander, um, which has found, I just found out has sadly passed away now, but she was the service dog of, uh, 
retired now professor uh, Raymond C. Love. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> she would come to the meeting as well. Let's see a question. Does the group have any activities together? Um, so far, I don't think we've done any activities together. We've planned it too in the past. Like one example, um, someone had the idea to have a like a dance. Um, and it was a really neat idea involving having like noise canceling headphones that could individually play music. That way each person could control the volume of the music and stuff. But sadly that was never something we were able to do. Um, and we also would discuss like things to put in the sensory break room at the Middletown campus. And there we go. <laughs> yes, we would discuss about what things would be helpful to have in there. Like we got um, some weighted blankets in there and there's a, a variety of um, fidget tools, things like that. It's great. Like I love the sensory break room. My first two weeks actually uh, of my first semester at the Middletown campus, like I basically hid in there for the first like two weeks of classes, <laughs> like between classes. <laughs> it's it saved saved me a lot, especially when I would get overstimulated. I would uh, just take some time and just um, relax and calm myself down in there, and that was extremely helpful. Yeah, and what's also great about it is the lighting in there. It's adjustable, so you could turn the lighting up or down whatever you need. So that was very helpful, especially if I was overstimulated with the lights because of the fluorescent lighting in the building. Yep. Um, is there any questions about Bond Club or the sensory break room? I don't have a question, but I think you did a good job. <laughs> great. I learned more about it than I even knew. And I work with Vivi. So it was great to hear it through your perspective. I tried. I added stuff too, other than I wrote down. <laughs> oh my God, Heather. That's amazing. Look at you. Good. <laughs> So how about, um, Sophia, what do you have to add to the presentation and to the experience as a student at the college? Um, <laughs> so I'm actually, Vivi's actually my advisor. Um, I first was accepted into the TRIO program because um, although my parents did go to college, they did not get degrees. So I am a first generation student. And then, um, after that, I got accommodations from Vivi. And um, at first I was like, I don't really, you know, I guess deserve accommodations or whatever, because like, I don't really have anything that, you know, I just have like general anxiety disorder and social anxiety disorder. But like when I take tests, it skyrockets and I'm having like panic attacks. I'm like, no, it's okay. I don't need any accommodations. And I actually did not tell my professors because I was too embarrassed to. And then the first test I had at Lord Fairfax, I got, I took in the room, which was a really bad idea because my accommodation said I can go take it elsewhere. But I didn't want to talk to the professors by myself. So I was like, oh, it's okay, I'll be fine. And I got probably like a 58 on the test. And then I had to go and talk to the professors and they let me take it again in the testing room this time. And I got over 90 on it. So I guess what I'm saying is use your accommodations. Um, don't be shy and don't be worried that your professors are judging you because 
they're not. And I still struggle with, with thinking like my professors are judging me or something, but they're really not. They just want to see you succeed and help you as much as you can. So. Hey, thank you, Sophia. And I know for Sophia too, public speaking isn't her favorite. So her coming here today is to encourage <laughs> all of you. So you don't feel alone and you know that you're going to have support while you're here. And um, with that being said, I know Amanda, she's a current student. She's here at well and, uh, as well and just wanted to share with you what it was like to come in as a brand new student um, in the hopes of encouraging you all as well. So Amanda, go ahead. So I used to attend a different college in Virginia and I was doing extremely bad. Um, as, uh, they didn't have the accommodations that they do at Lord Fairfax. And so I was about to drop out of college. And then one of my friends was telling me that you can go to different community colleges, not in your area. <laughs> so I decided to check out Lord Fairfax. And from the minute I called, um, I was immediately greeted by someone smiling and telling me all the different things and setting me up and emailing me a list of people to get in contact with if I needed any help with anything financial aid wise just everybody. <laughs> and then I reached out to Kelly about student programs and I was really excited about student ambassadors. And then she was like, well, um, you can apply your first semester. And so I was really nervous because at the old college I used to attend, I was not able to really even do two classes. And since I've started to attend here, I'm taking three classes, I'm doing student ambassadors, and I'm working more hours than I was at my job here and I'm still maintaining my A average. And it's all due to the fact of, I, um, I'm in TRIO as well. And I have accommodation letters. Um, I get longer test times. I get to take them in the testing center. I get priority seating because I have a weird thing where I can't have people sitting in front of me or if, I, if they're behind me, I have to be up to the wall um it's just my little anxiety ticks <laughs> and just when you reach out to anybody at Lord Fairfax you always get greeted by someone smiling and they're willing to help with everything and if they can't answer your question they are so willing to find whoever can answer your question even when I called the 24-7 financial aid I was able to they told me, well, you need to get in contact with this person. They don't come in usually until this time, but this is who you got to get in contact with to get your financial aid sorted. And so I wouldn't have known that if I wouldn't have been able to call and they would have looked up all my info and told me and my old college would never have done that. <laughs> but I love Lord Fairfax and I love how they really do set you up for succeeding. And I'm not just saying that <laughs> it's completely true. That is amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I know we're all going to cry. No, really, because it's that's what Vivian and I are here for. That's why we do what we do at Lord Fairfax, because we genuinely care about students and their success and helping them find their right path to being successful. You know, and like Vivi said, everyone's so different. So we're just, we're happy to be here to help. And Amanda, I'm so glad you found your second home at LFCC. Um, Vivi, was there anything you wanted to add before we go into Q&A? I don't think so. I just am really like, I, that was just really like uplifting, honestly. <laughs> it's so good to hear from students too. Cause I feel like staff members, we do a lot of presentations and a lot of talking, but it's so good to hear what students have to say. So big, big thank you to Heather and Sophia and Amanda. That was amazing. Awesome. So we are going to pause recording then so we can go to Q&A with the people who are joining us here on Zoom. And we're also going to pause the Facebook live feed. If you are watching on Facebook, whether it's now or it's later, uh, please feel free to shoot Vivian email. It's V-M-E-D-E-R, just like you see here at lfcc.edu. She would love to help you.